Namaskar. My name is Mitra Desai, and I'm speaking to you today regarding India's pioneering contribution to the vaccination story. Of course, there's an incredibly large body of pioneering contributions made by Bharat, but most of them have remained either untold or have been erased. In this presentation, we will consider only one such story, and that is the story of how India enabled vaccination. Now, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land that I'm speaking to you from today. I'm speaking to you from the Gabi Gabi country, and I pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging. The traditional owners of the land have looked after this part of Australia for over 18,000 years. In the rather unfortunate story of colonization and greed, there have been very few of them left, and they try to keep their traditions alive. And in many ways, this is a shared experience with Bharat. I would also like to take this opportunity to thank Vivekananda Kendra and Vivekananda Prabodhini for giving me this opportunity. Many experts and stalwarts have already presented on this forum, so I feel quite honored to be able to speak here today. So our topic today is India's pioneering contribution to the vaccination story. What's in store for us in this talk? Well, we're going to look at the dominant narrative. We'll understand a little bit of the background uh, and some contextual information. Then we'll look at India's, uh, India's contribution, which has subsequently been erased. And hopefully by the end of this talk, we will go away with an amended narrative or a new story for ourselves. Now, in this conversation, I will briefly touch upon some of the information that um, I have presented elsewhere, which is Sushrut and his Samhita. That is a micro documentary that's currently available both on YouTube as well as my website, tejomaybharat.com. Uh, but I'll use some of the information from that presentation or research here. So let's dive in. Now, today we asked Google who discovered vaccines or who uh, administered vaccine and for which disease, uh, it'll throw a plethora of information, which will tell you that it was Edward Jenner who discovered the vaccine. And obviously it was administered in response to smallpox. So that is the current dominant narrative. Now to understand how we got here, we need to look at some background or contextual information. Since smallpox has been uh, eradicated for over 40 years now, we need to understand a little bit of the, about the disease itself. So smallpox was a highly contagious um, virus and it spread through person-to-person -person contact. The early symptoms were high fever and a fatigue. Then a rash appeared and two to three days later, particularly on the face, arms and legs, uh, it turned into spots filled with clear fluid and pus which then formed a crust that eventually dried and fell off. There was an incubation period of seven to 17 days after exposure. Humans were infected by coming in touch with the droplets of a smallpox infected person. A healthy person would become infected if they inhaled fluid droplets from the infected individual. Uh, so for example, through sneezing or coughing. Now a person only became infectious once the fever developed. And the most infectious period was during the first week of illness. But a sick person remained contagious until the last scabs fell off. Many survived. Some also turned blind. Anyone who survived developed a lifelong immunity for subsequent outbreaks. Now, this has been a disease that has been with us for a very long time. Uh, in the third century, we find references to rashes uh, being found on Egyptian mummies. By the fourth century, uh, we find unmistakable written description in the Chinese records. By the sixth century, increased trade between China and Korea introduces it to Japan. By the seventh century, the Arab expansion takes it into Northern Africa, Spain, and Portugal. By 11th century, the Crusades further spread smallpox in Europe. By 15th century, Portuguese occupation introduces this disease to um, parts of Western Africa. By 16th century, we're already seeing it in the Caribbean uh, and the Central and South Americas. By 17th century, 
we're seeing it in uh, North America and in the 18th century, it has made its way all the way to Australia. So as you can see, this has been a disease that has been prevalent for a very, very long time and has reached every uh, corner of the globe. It wasn't by any means a small or an insignificant disease either. So in his paper, The Eradication of Smallpox, an overview of the past, present and future, Donald Henderson tells us that it claimed nearly 5 million deaths per year. So not only was this prevalent for a very long time, but across the globe, it claimed a significant number of lives each year. So if it had been prevalent for such a long time across the world, surely there were some treatments. We find that uh, the early European treatments were a mixed bag. There were some herbal remedies and cold remedies. Now there's one particular Dr. Sydneyham who is said to have treated his patients with 12 bottles of beer every 24 hours. So clearly he must have been a very popular doctor at the time. Then there's the mention of Chinese encephalation. That information comes to us uh, in about 1549. And there it looks like inoculators did not reveal their secrets. And as a result, it was difficult to establish exactly what was happening in China. So again, the situation back then was no different to what it is that we're currently seeing. Another mention is that of Turkish variolation. Now, in 1703, Dr. Emmanuel Timoni, he writes about the Turkish variolation. Uh, it's basically a letter written to an exiled king, uh, exiled Swedish king, which is then subsequently translated into French and finally printed in English in 1714. So this is the first known account of variolation, which was the most successful way of treating smallpox in the, at the beginning of the 17th century. So what's variolation you ask? Well, it is also known as inoculation. It's now an obsolete method of immunizing patients against smallpox by infecting them with the substance from the pustules of a patient who suffered a mild form of the disease. Now, the one person who championed variolation was Lady Mary Montague. She was the wife of a British ambassador to the Ottoman court. She had her five-year-old son variolated in 1718. Subsequently, when she returned to London, London experienced smallpox epidemic in 1721. That's when she even had her daughter variolated. Seeing both her children presented well, um, she proposed that as a solution to the royalty to make sure that they were safe as well. But Caroline, the Princess of Wales, she needed assurances. So um, she suggested human experiments. So what they did was they found six prisoners, six condemned prisoners in from the Newgate prison between the ages of 19 to 36. And they decided to administer variolation on them. Now these prisoners were condemned to a death penalty anyway. So if they survived the procedure, then they would be granted pardon. The variolation was successful. And so all of these prisoners were actually uh, pardoned. And what that meant was this cure was now secured to be administered to the royal family, especially the adults. But Princess Caroline was not so sure whether it can still be administered to the young prince and princesses. So she had another idea. She organized for five orphans from St. James Parish uh, in Westminster. And then they were used as uh, an experiment and variolation was used on them. And once it was successful on those five orphans, it was made available to the royal prince and princesses. Now, you see, this new procedure was considered extremely controversial at that time. It was argued by the church that the practice was both dangerous and sinful because only God had the power to inflict disease. But over the centuries, it became relatively routine um, to protect people using this procedure. So the upper class, as you can see, was the first beneficiary of this available treatment. 
it took nearly another 20 years before uh, this treatment was made available to the middle class of the European society. And it took even longer before it finally became available to the lowest strata of the European society. Then along came Jenner. Now he was an extremely curious, studious and enterprising young person. Um, he has a fascinating biography and I invite viewers to read through more about him online. By the age of 13, he was already working as an apprentice with his local doctor. By the time he was 21, he had sufficient knowledge to start as an apprentice under a famous surgeon in London. By the time he was 24, he returned to his hometown and became a practicing GP. Now, Google and Wikipedia will tell you that Jenner knew, even as a young boy, that anyone who suffers from cowpox does not die from smallpox. He, in fact, he knew that because it was common knowledge all across Europe. So he continued practicing medicine for 23 years. And in 1796, he decided that he's going to investigate the cure for smallpox. And voila, 12 months later, he had found a cure. He promptly wrote to the Royal Society, who obviously promptly rejected his cure. So what he did was he wrote to other doctors who gradually experimented with his methods and they agreed with his findings. So it was indeed declared a successful cure and the British Parliament granted him uh, 10,000 pounds in 1802. Uh, his work was considered to have such a great significance across the world that five years later, in 1807, he was granted another £5,000. So what started as a vaccination drive in about 1802 eventually made the world smallpox free in 1978. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning, it was common knowledge across Europe that if you suffered from cowpox, you did not suffer from smallpox. So what Edward Jenner did was um, there was a dairy maiden. Her name was Sarah Nelms. Now she was suffering from cowpox. So Jenner extracted the pus material from her and then he injected that in an eight-year-old boy whose name was James Phipp. He was um, Jenner's gardener's son. So once he infected um, James Phipps with cowpox, James developed and survived cowpox. Then Jenner uh, injected in him the smallpox pus material and James failed to develop any infection. That is when Jenner declared that the cure was now complete. He had in effect confirmed that if you suffer from cowpox, you don't suffer from smallpox. Now, I'm not speaking here today to take anything away from Jenner's work. It was important for the times that he lived in. But what I'm saying is there's more to this story. And like they say, truth always prevails. So on September 30th, uh, 2020, BBC Future published an article titled Chilling Experiment that created the first vaccine. And in that experiment, uh, sorry, in that article, we get two striking admissions. We read from Rene Najera, who is an epidemiologist and the editor of History of Vaccines website, where she tells us about an incident of how orphans were used as vaccine carriers to South America. In there, we get the first mention that Jenner did all this without knowing what he was dealing with. And further in that same article, Renee's sentiments are echoed by professor of immunology, Sheila Kreushank, who confirms that Jenner had no understanding of the science underlying the discovery, nor did they have any concept of immunity, let alone of adaptive immunity. So at this stage, we already know that there's a lot of unanswered questions. For example, if it was common knowledge across Europe for centuries, why had Europe failed to put two and two together before Jenner? Or Jenner had been practicing medicine as a GP for nearly 23, 24 years before he decided to investigate the cure for smallpox. 
Why did he wait for 24 years? How is it that he was then able to solve this puzzle that had troubled humanity several centuries from the third century? He was able to solve that in 12 months. How? What really happened? Something did happen. And the answer, surprisingly, actually unsurprisingly, comes to us from the underlying Bharatiya wisdom. The missing link we find in several documents or accounts that come from Bharat. Let's look at some of them uh, that are available to us from the British and French records. Now, this account is from 1731, and it's a letter written by Robert Coult to Dr. Oliver Coult. In that, Robert tells us that the operation of inoculation uh, is called by the natives as tika. And as far as they can tell, it has been practiced for nearly 150 years at that point already. And it was practiced by one Dhanvantari, and this operation was a tightly kept secret at that stage. Now, barely two decades later, we come across an account which details the process. Reverend Charles Chase in Essay Apologetique in 1754 tells us that this method was prevalent in Bengal for a very long time and that variolous material was preserved in a twisted thread that was inserted in a needle, which was then passed between flesh and skin. There's also a first-hand account from an English lady who had both her children inoculated. Now, the English lady reported that the inoculator told her that some variolous material was preserved from the time of his grandfather or great-grandfather. Now, this starts telling us that India at the time not only was delivering this treatment, but had a well-developed understanding of preserving and storing highly contagious material for generations. The third account, now this is the most detailed account. This comes to us from Dr. John Howell, and he has delivered this to the London College of Physicians in 1767. This account tells us that Vrindavan, Allahabad, and Banaras Brahmins traveled, uh, pr traveled two distinct provinces, and they arrived at their destinations before the disease of smallpox returned each year. And although they arrived in February, they did not begin inoculating until they had assessed the state of distemper. This means that we're now looking at a specialized or a specialist branch of knowledge who had extremely well-developed understanding of the seasonal patterns of when the disease occurs. But not only that, they even had a nuanced understanding of when to actually start delivering the treatment. Um, Dr. Howell tells us that, uh, he tells us more about the process and the instrument used to deliver the treatment. He tells us that 15 to 16 minute incisions are made in a small circle using a tool that was about four and a half inches long. The instrument, is precisely the same that barbers use to cut the nails and to depurate the ears of the customers. So whether this instrument was the inspiration to the rotary lancet that was later used to administer vaccines, we don't know, but we'll need to find out more. You'll notice that the Brahmins never inoculated with fresh matter, nor with matter from the disease that was caught in the natural way which means that these treating specialists had sufficiently advanced understanding of immunology to know that less virulent strains of the contagion needed to be used in the practice of variolation. Finally, the most striking information is that only one in a million failed of receiving the infection. Dr. Howell tells us that this practice of the East must have been followed without variation and with uniform success, and it must have been originally founded on rational principles and experiment. Now, this is also where we interestingly find the first mention of Shitra Devi or Guttiki Thakurain. Uh, 
Now, this is a thread that we will explore slightly further on in the talk after we've concluded the knowledge gap information here. So based on what we've learned so far, we come to a revised timeline. Um, 1796 is when Jenner successfully developed the smallpox vaccine, but we see that that comes after Dr. Howell has already addressed the College of Physicians. When we place the two other accounts in that timeline, uh, the one from Robert Kuhl as well as Essay Apologetic, we can see that Indians had been delivering successful treatment from smallpox as early as 1581. So Bharat had a native method of treating smallpox, which was documented by early 15th century. So the new picture that emerges for us is that um, not only were we treating smallpox, we had a well-developed understanding of when the disease struck, we had multiple methods of treating it, and we had a system of preserving highly infectious material for generations. So the obvious knowledge gap that our Bharatiya wisdom filled for Europe is that missing link. It's the concept of adaptive immunity. Now, adaptive immunity is an immunity that occurs after exposure to an antigen, either from a pathogen or from a vaccination. Now, Bharat and its rich medical advances provided Europe with the understanding that an infection can be introduced in a non-immune person. Jenner was able to combine two and two together to come up with the concept of vaccination as we understand it today. Now, we are unaware of Bharat's contribution, and as is the case with all colonial plunder, knowledge continues to be taken from us without credit. If we did something like this today, um, you would be accused of lack of integrity in your academic research or plagiarism, all sorts of charges will be leveled at you. But we see that even till date, this profound knowledge gift from the Indian knowledge systems remains unacknowledged. What's also interesting is that a picture of Bharat that emerges from these accounts is fascinating. One account tells us that the inoculators were local cultivators. They were both Hindus and Muslims. Another account tells us that even uh, Daivadnya Brahmins, who were the astrology Brahmins, they would administer inoculation. Another account tells us that smallpox was, uh, the inoculation was also provided by garland makers and barbers. One account further tells us that it was administered by barbers who also possessed a specific book for that called Vasantatika. So this is the picture of Bharat that we've never considered before. We don't have to go to a specialist. The treatment was simplified to a point where anyone was able to administer it, thereby making it cost effective for the people of Bharat. Now let's look at the Shitra Devi part of it. In the book called History of Smallpox, 1851, James Moore tells us um, that the Brindavan, Banaras, or the Allahabad Brahmins, when they traveled and delivered their treatments, during the treatment, they recited prayers appointed in the Atharvanaved for propitiating the female divinity. Now, this Devi was called Guttiki Thakurain uh, in the Bengal presidency and those areas. But around the Maharashtra, Gujarat, Rajasthan, all of these areas, she was known as Shitra Devi. And down south, she was known as uh, Mariamman. But as you can tell, that from the times of Atharvanaved, this has been a part of the Hindu civilization that we have acknowledged that there is a goddess of eruptions. Now, there's various versions of Shitra Devi. She is sometimes depicted fair in complexion, wearing either red or light blue robes, a minimal amount of ornaments on her limbs. Uh, sometimes she's depicted as three-eyed and very youthful in appearance. She is considered to be a powerful reincarnation of Durga. Now, in one hand, she holds a pointy broom, 
and in another there's a pot which she uses to cure the diseased she has a winnowing fan adorning her hair and is mounted on the back of a donkey as her vehicle now it's important to note that the images of our devis and devatas are multidimensional and they're open to one or more interpretation so the commonly accepted interpretation is that she carries the pot of cold water to relieve the patient's fever the broom is a reminder to keep the surroundings clean the winnowing fan on her head depicts fanning the patients when they're burning with fever to lower the body temperature our interpretation of shitra devi's iconography is that the pointy broom signals a sharp instrument to prick or pierce the skin and the pot carries the variolous material now she's often said to be accompanied by jwarasura who's the fever demon ola devi the cholera goddess by a few other deities for minor diseases and uh, eruptions so how were these eruptions identified in our earliest writings well the earliest ayurvedic texts talk about masurika now uh, as you can see if you read devanagari you'll see on the screen that there's masurika nidanam this is a chapter from nidana by madhokara which was composed in the early 8th century now he is drawing on the earlier works such as charaka samhita sushrut samhita ashtanga hridaya samhita and ashtanga sangraha and sudhasara so it contains an extensive chapter on masurika now in the 7th century as well we find vagbhata's ashtanga hridaya samhita um to contain information on masurika vagbhata is in turn drawing on the prior works of charaka and sushruta so masurika as mentioned is in sushrut samhita is basically uh, said to be a kshudra roga so it was possibly not as widespread in his times as it came to be by the time madhavakara and vagbhata talk about it so as you can clearly see that we even by sushruta's time we had an understanding of um, the disease now sushrut describes an accurate uh, description yellow or copper colored pustules attended with pain fever and burning appeared all over the body and face and inside the cavity and the mouth and that is called masurika so uh, if you look at this girl who's suffering from masurika and and look at the picture of actual actual masur ki dal the description is exactly accurate so you can clearly see that we had a well developed understanding now we've already seen that we're taking works from sushruta madhavbhata uh, madhavakara as well as vagbhata and those works were available by the 7th century so it should come as no surprise that this knowledge transferred out of bharat as early as 7th or 8th century in fact there are references that the charak samhita was translated into arabic um, by the 9th century in the 9th century as well sushrut samhita was translated in arabic as early as the 5th century a persian doctor by the name of burzaw he traveled to india and he had taken back medical books which were later translated into other languages so remember earlier on we saw there was a mention of turkish variolation in the 17th century that should not come as a surprise at all because bharat had been sending out knowledge from as early as 5th century now this is where i will draw upon the sushrut uh, research that we previously done and this is primarily the contribution of shri nilesh ok who has been working on uh, dating of mahabharat but one of the things we did was we triangulated the information available in ancient uh, indian narratives we looked at the internal evidence of sushrut samhita garud puran as well as mahabharat and we can confidently say that maharshi sushrut lived during mahabharat times or prior as early as 7581 years ago 
And that information will have been available to Bharat from that long ago. So when we look at all of this, <clears throat> the new timeline or the new narrative that we can write for ourselves is this. Long before Europe even discovered what it was, Europeans have themselves documented that India was successfully administering treatment for smallpox. Um, by the information available to us, Madhokara and Vagbhata were successfully treating it as early as the seventh century. And based on uh, Nileshji's research, we can even claim that that information was available to us seven and a half thousand years ago. So treating smallpox since ancient times was a well-developed, well-entrenched thing within the Bharatiya psyche. We had multiple methods of treating it. We had excellent understanding of when the disease reoccurred. We knew how to preserve and transfer the material from generation to generation. And our ancestors, who were the masters of keeping it simple, had encapsulated all their knowledge about the disease and the treatment in the iconography of Shitra Devi and the festivals that we still celebrate today, um, whether it is the Shitra Ashtami or the Basoda, which still remind us to continue the traditions that we have inherited. Now, through all of this, um, another unfortunate picture also emerges. And that is how the profound knowledge systems of Bharat have been systematically erased. So these are only just four of the accounts. There's a few others as well. But in one of them, by 1761, uh, Dr. Kirk Patrick, he arrogantly remarks that though we give entire credit to the English lady, an equal credit to her Indian doctor is not a necessary consequence. So it doesn't matter who's treating her or what the treatment is. What matters is that the English lady got treat herself treated by a brown person in India. Now, in another account, we see that this wonderful invention was found out not by the learned sons of erudition, but by a mean, coarse, rude sort of people. By 1758, a British columnist is already writing that England may be termed as the native country of inoculation. How? You have documented it yourself that India was successfully administering the treatment long before you did. So how did you come to that conclusion? We have no idea. So by 1810, the encyclopedias coming out of uh, Europe were already telling us that uh, inoculation was originally received from the hands of ignorism, ignorance and barbarism. And he further happily said, the encyclopedist, that happily our learned countrymen did not measure the value of the practice by the meanness of its origins, but by its real importance and utility. They became examples for adopting it and they encouraged it and the rest of the world. So essentially, here we can see that they took all of the information, they actually adopted it, and somehow decided that they were the ones who created all of this wonderful body of knowledge. So the more we read, the more we study, the more we realize that it is impossible to tell the story of human civilization without some foundational contribution or enabling technology that came from Bharat. And yet we live in a world where the impossible has been made possible. All the stories around us are currently being told as if Bharat never existed. So my book, Shitara, How India Enabled Vaccination, is just a small, humble attempt of sharing this story with everyone to make sure that we can pass on this knowledge to the next generation. The story unfolds as a beautiful conversation between the starry-eyed Tara, who is looking to the West for all the answers, and her nana, her grandfather, who is an Ayurveda Acharya and steeped in the Sanatan ethos. So it's a beautiful conversation and a wonderful story. So if reading's your thing, 
please do pick up the book and let me know how you find it. I'm very grateful and I thank you for the gift of attention of your time. I hope this talk has given you some actual evidence and accounts that you can talk about um, in your discussions with your friends and family and start changing the mainstream narrative so that we can tell ourselves a new story. Thank you.